I'm going to open us up in prayer. Lord God, what a great opportunity we have to hear about you. Lord, to hear what John, your beloved disciple, wrote about you in this book. Lord, I pray that my words are clear, that we walk out of here with a greater love for you, knowing that the Lord of the universe came down, walked among us, and went to the cross for our sins, Lord. In your name, amen. So tonight, I'm going to teach on the book of John. One of my favorite memories as a parent was I used to take the kids out for, we called it Bible time, and we would usually go and get ice cream or donuts or something somewhere and open up God's Word and read it together. And one of the boys, I honestly am pretty sure I know which one, but I'll just keep them anonymous. Um, we were going through this book, and we came to John 3 in the story of um, Nicodemus. And in chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And at that moment, this child started laughing so hard. He like could not get past the fact that this, this, just the example of going back into the mother's womb, and he was cracking up. We spent a while talking about it, and then transitioned to just have a really clear, interesting um, just presentation of the gospel with a four-year-old kid. And, and that's what I love about this book, is on every single page, there is a clear presentation of the gospel. So I want to spend a lot of time in this book tonight. The Gospel of John is just one of four Gospels, right? We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and here we are at John. And all of them tell about the life of Christ on earth. So let's ask the question, what makes this one unique? What makes John different? The similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are so obvious that they're called the synoptic gospels because they match each other in many ways. They employ similar language, even identical at some points, and yet John is different. As one begins to read John, he soon notices some of these differences and sees how obvious they are. John leaves out many things that either one or more of the synoptics will include. John doesn't give an account of Christ's birth. There's no mention of Christ's baptism, although he clearly presupposes a knowledge of it by the readers. The institution of the Lord's Supper is missing. There's no ascension. What is perhaps most striking is there's no parables. And at the same time, John shows a detailed knowledge of things that the other gospels omit. For instance, John reports on an early ministry of Jesus in Judea. He indicates that the duration of Christ's ministry was close to three years, and yet the other Gospels leave you with the impression it's closer to one. John alone speaks of Jesus changing water into wine at Cana. He alone tells of Nicodemus, of the woman in Samaria, and of Jesus raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. Only in John do we find the great discourses spoken by Jesus to his own disciples during the final week in Jerusalem. John gives us a unique view of Jesus that we would miss if we only read the synoptics. So who was John? John was the younger brother of James. They were the sons of Zebedee, and the three of them were fishermen, John, James, and, his dad, and their dad, when Jesus called the sons. According to Mark, Jesus gave the two brothers an Aramaic surname that is translated to mean the sons of thunder. The name may be a sign of what they would become, mighty witnesses and voices from heaven. However, in the gospel, John rarely speaks. In any of the gospels, he rarely speaks. Maybe that's why Jesus loved him. He kept quiet and didn't say things that put his foot in his mouth. There's something we should learn from that, but I'm not going to. John is 
traditionally identified as the beloved disciple. John is never explicitly named in the Gospel of John, although he is indirectly mentioned in several passages, and he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. The beloved disciple is Peter's companion, and he is sometimes called the other disciple and is presented as the closest one to Jesus. He leans on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. He acts as an intermediary between Peter and Jesus in chapter 13. He is entrusted with the care of Jesus' mother. He reaches the empty tomb before any other disciple in John 20, verse 4. He is the first to believe in the resurrection, and he recognizes the risen Lord and identifies him for Peter. That's John. John had a unique relationship with Jesus and wrote a unique book about him. So what is this book all about? It is a historically accurate book of evidence that Jesus was the Christ. And if you believe, you have life in his name. John himself insisted upon the reliability of the things in which he writes. In 1 John 1, John says that he is writing to them about a person whom he has heard, seen, and touched. Hence, he is writing about something that is objectively true that will bear the brunt of historical investigation. And John makes the same assertion in this gospel. Chapter 20, verse 30 says, Therefore many other signs Jesus did in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. People will say faith is something that must be divorced from evidence, but that's not stated in the Bible. Faith is believing in something or someone on the basis of evidence and then acting upon it. In this case, John has provided evidence for the full deity of Jesus so that the readers, whether in his age or ours, might believe it and commit their lives to Jesus as their savior. In John's gospel, we have an accurate record of things that were said and done almost 2,000 years ago by a Jew named Jesus of Nazareth. They are presented to us as evidence for his extraordinary claims. If one will believe this and approach the record honestly with an open mind, God will use it to bring that person to fullness of faith in the Lord Jesus and God's son, as God's son and his savior. And this was John's purpose in writing the gospel. And it's our primary purpose in being here tonight. If you do not put your faith in Jesus as your savior, please listen close. Hear this evidence. And if you're a believer, listen to this evidence. When was the last time you thought about the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah? John can be topically organized into a few categories, and that's the way we're going to approach it tonight. The book of John reveals the Messiah. It reveals the Messiah through eyewitness claims. It reveals the Messiah through Jesus' signs. Jesus makes claims that show that he's the Messiah. There are discourses in this book that reveal that Jesus is the Messiah, and in his death and sweet resurrection narrative, he is revealed as the Messiah. And then as he parts from these disciples, he leaves a message that reminds us that he is the Messiah. However, when you have an entire book and only one hour, it's pretty tricky to figure out how to break the lesson up. Since you guys wanna go home tonight, I can't teach on each of these topics. I'd love to, um, but I've spent most of our, my time in prep and most of what I'm going to prepare and present to you guys tonight is evidence that Jesus was the Messiah so that we can emphasize John's stated purpose of this book, to show that Jesus is the Messiah. What is the significance of this? First off, it shows us that Jesus is God, that God walked the earth. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called 
wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal father, prince of peace. I believe that John had this verse in view when he wrote this book. He knew that Jews of his day were looking for that king, and many of them did not see Jesus as the embodiment of this prophecy. But John did. So open up your Bibles, let's turn to to the book of John, and let's look at the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. And then jump down to verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in verse 16, it says, For his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. This section of scripture is always so amazing to me. John speaks with such boldness and authority when he makes these claims about Jesus. He sets the table for a book of evidence with some key truths he opens the book within the beginning. Looking at the synoptics, they all start with the life of Jesus on earth. But John starts with all life on earth, and Jesus was there. In this short prologue, John highlights some really important truths about who Jesus was. He highlights the preeminence of Jesus by saying that he was there with God in the beginning. He tells you that Jesus was the creator. Have you thought about that? Jesus was the one that created. He describes Jesus as a man, that Jesus became flesh. Jesus was God's glory shown to man. And Jesus was the one that brought grace. John starts this off with a bang. And then he talks about John the Baptist. I was talking to John McCoy, and there's a lot of Johns, talking to John McCoy about this on Thursday, and he made an interesting observation that I told him I would steal. So here we go. This is not my my observation, but I'm stealing it. Both John and Mark start their narratives with John the Baptist. Luke pretty much starts there, and Jesus' ministry doesn't start without John the Baptist in Matthew. Clearly, John's life and ministry was a prerequisite for the ministry of Jesus. Every single gospel starts there. John the Baptist's ministry was huge. I don't think we think about this either. If you look outside of the biblical narrative, his ministry was significant. Not all Jews correlated his ministry with Jesus's, but they saw a significant ministry that John was having. Josephus speaks of John by saying, nothing of a connection with Jesus. Rather, Josephus notes that some Jews believed that Herod's military defeat was a punishment from God because God was angry that Herod put John to death. That's interesting. Josephus' statements attest to John's reception among the Jewish people, suggesting that Herod killed John because he was afraid of John's power due to his popularity with the Jewish people. Josephus even says that people were ready to do whatever John said. At the very least, Josephus' account seems to show that John's ministry was timely and well-received in first century Palestine. In the Gospels, he is clearly more significant to the coming of the Messiah than we usually give him credit. Most of my life, I thought of John as a character in the story, but I don't think that's how the disciples looked at him. John was the one who prepared the way for God's Messiah and rule, the very thing many Jews anticipated. I skipped the verses in the prologue, but John the Baptist was a significant player there. In ancient Greek dramas, prologues provided the who and what of the events, but they allowed the unfolding of the story to tell you the how. 
In the prologue here, John introduces the character called the Word and lists his characteristics. He then introduces another character, John. John is the bridge connecting the theological significance assigned to the Word in the prologue with Jesus, the main character of this gospel. Then, in the following verses, after the prologue, in John's own voice, he confirms what was said about him in the prologue. He states that he is not the Messiah, but the one who prepares his way. In this passage, John also attests to Jesus' superiority over him, declares Jesus' baptism as one of the Holy Spirit, and identifies Jesus as the Son of God and Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thus, John both makes Jesus, who is unknown at this time, known, and explains the nature of his messianic purpose. Let's read some of that section really quickly. Um, you're still in John chapter 1, just turn to verse 22. Therefore they said to him, Who are you, so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he, this is John the Baptist, said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. This is a reference to Isaiah 40. Let me read that really quickly. Isaiah 40, verse 3 says, A voice is calling, Prepare the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. John the Baptist is clearly saying here that he will be the one to prepare the path for God to reveal his glory. John called Jesus Yahweh. Did you catch that? In verse 23, he says, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make, way of the, make, make straight the way of the Lord. And then in 43, he says, prepare the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Both John the Beloved and John the Baptist knew why Jesus came to earth. And in the story of John the Baptist, Jesus was already revealed as God. Jump down to verse 29 of John chapter 1. On the next day, he, John the Baptist still, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who will be ahead of me, for he existed before me. John the Baptist makes bold claims about Jesus' deity. John the Baptist had to be a part of this story to fully reveal Jesus as the Messiah. The next topic, time I wanna, uh, topic I wanna spend time on is the signs. There are seven signs in this book, seven stories of miracles. Um, I actually wanna spend some time going through each one of those. Um, we could do a sermon on each one of those um, and be here forever. But I wanna highlight two things from each of them. I want to highlight who the audience was and how it resulted in belief. But before I do that, John 21, 25 says, there are many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written one after the other, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that it would be written. This book of John, this gospel of John, is, is a list of things that John, the beloved apostle, thought were the most important things to write about Jesus. If he had written everything he wanted to write, he says that the world wouldn't have held all the books. And so he picked these specific signs to reveal who God was. And so I want to look at these specific signs. So let's start at the wedding at Cana. This is in John chapter 2. I love this exchange between Jesus and his mother. John chapter 2, verse 1 says, and on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. These few verses tell us a lot about what Mary knew of her son. She didn't even have to use words to ask him to make wine. She just was like, hey Jesus, they're out of wine. And he's like, mom, 
Don't make that my problem, please. You know, this isn't the time when I'm going to show the world my power. And she hears him clearly, understands and honors his request by telling the servants to let him fix the problem. This exchange tells us something amazing about both the humanness and the godness of Jesus. And look at the audience of this sign in verse 11. Jesus did this in Cana of Galilee as the beginning of his signs and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. John notes that this first sign demonstrated Jesus' glory to the disciples, and they believed. Let's jump to chapter 4, when Jesus heals a royal official's son. I talked about this um, miracle in a communion message a few months ago, but I want to I review it again today. So in John chapter 4, four verse 46... He says, Then he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was asking him to come down and heal his son, for he was about to die. So Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son lives. The man believed the word Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. And while he was still going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was alive. So he inquired of them the hour in which he began to get better. And then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was at that hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This is again a second sign that Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. There are four observations to make from this passage. The father was desperate. He traveled 25 miles uphill over difficult terrain to see Jesus. This wasn't a short trip to a crowd by his house. He somehow heard that Jesus was making his way through Judea Jesus was traveling a long ways up towards Galilee and was now in Cana. Word was spreading about Jesus and what he was saying and doing, and so this royal official tracked him down there. His father had means to provide his son with every medical option, but nothing worked. So he left his dying son, conceivably for the last time, to go have one last-ditch effort and talk to this man that he'd heard about. It wasn't like Jesus had a reputation for healing sick. It says here in verse 54 that this was the second sign. But he was baptizing and he was speaking with power. And at this stage of the ministry, this father just was desperate and needed anything he could find. And so then we look at Jesus' verbal response. Jesus said, I believe is a shepherding proclamation. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. I think this was less of a correction and more of a statement of fact. He was starting his sign ministry and was telling the crowds he knew this was what they needed. What belief is Jesus referring to here? In this passage, the word believe is stated three times. There's the one we just mentioned that Jesus spoke. And then at verse 50, it says the official believed Jesus. Here it is clear from the context that he believed that Jesus, Jesus, that his son was alive. And then we get to verse 53, and it says that he believes again, this time with his whole household. The second belief by the official is the belief of what Jesus is talking about. This is a different kind of belief. When Jesus is talking about belief, he is calling out this crowd for needing signs to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the source of life. And of course, these signs and wonders emphasize that, which leads us to the next point. Jesus made a compassionate act. There are many ways that Jesus could have put on display his power, but he healed this man's son. 
He put on display his love. He put on display his mercy. He put on display his omniscience. I mean, think about it. It was 25 miles away. He, he didn't, had never met this kid. And he just immediately said, this boy is healed. He knew exactly which kid this was. And he healed him from a distance. That is power. Jesus' compassionate act at this moment gave us a glimpse into who he really is. Which leads us to the final observation in this section the family's belief. What's interesting here is the way that Jesus revealed himself in this miracle. He was amongst a crowd when the father came to him. And he spoke to the crowd when he answered the father. But he didn't go with the father. I think he, if he had, the crowd would have followed. And if they followed, they would have all witnessed this miracle. But that wasn't what Jesus wanted to happen at this point. He sent the father away so his household would believe. Jesus chose to save his household and not the whole crowd. That's important to note. Back in John 20, verse 29, it says, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me and ha have you believed, blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. This is a book of evidence, but Christian, we're ones that read this evidence, trust it as truth, and believe. Let's move to the next sign, chapter 5. The healing at Bethesda. Starting in verse 2, it says, Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos, in these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after stirring up the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever sickness with which he was afflicted. And a man was there who had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been sick a long time, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And immediately the man became well. And picked up his mat and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man, who, have, who had been healed? It, it is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, He who made me well is the one who said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. They asked, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your mat and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and disclosed to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. There are a couple of observations to be made from this one. Jesus changed this man's perspective completely. The part in brackets in verses 3 and 4 are not in the original manuscript, but they help us understand a likely pagan practice of waiting for the healing powers of the waters. Jesus knew of this practice and referred to it with the man, but then showed the power did not come from waters, but from God. The Jews missed the point and called this a Sabbath issue. And Jesus responded by saying, my father is always working and so am I. This sign was to start showing the Pharisees what they were up against. And then we move on to a very familiar one of Jesus feeding the 5,000. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip a lot of this, but I want to highlight the audience. The crowd was there at this point to see signs. This is interesting that the purpose of the signs is to show that Jesus is the Christ, but people were there to see a show. Even now, 
he saw this was a teaching moment and asked Philip. In verse 5 of John chapter 6, he says, Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where should we buy bread so that all these people can eat? And this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone will receive a little. We know the story from here. A boy with two fish and five loaves offered his food, and Jesus turned that into enough to feed 5,000 men plus 12 baskets full. And then in verse 14 it says, Therefore when the people saw the sign which he had done, they were saying, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus wasn't doing parlor tricks. This was the Lord of the universe doing things only he could do. Look at verse 15 with me. So Jesus, knowing that they were going to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. This verse is so sad. People were starting to believe that he was the Messiah, and their response was to make him king. They were looking for the Savior, but they didn't understand what their biggest problem was. It was sin. They were looking at the world and knew they wanted a king, and they didn't see that they really needed a savior. On your own, go ahead and read verses 26 through 40 of this chapter. It will bless you to see how Jesus makes this point. The next sign is when Jesus walked on the sea. I'm not gonna spend time reviewing this one, but I do wanna make one observation because I can't help myself and just skip it. The disciples were getting quite used to spending time with Jesus at this point. He disappeared to a, mount, a mountain, and they didn't go looking for him. They just went to the sea, hopped on a boat, and started their way across on a seven-mile journey. Then they saw, during a storm, a man walking, and that freaked them out. Until Jesus said it was him, and then they're like, oh, hop on the boat. You can get on with me. From what I can tell, they'd made it about halfway through that journey, and we're struggling because of the storm, and then boom, Jesus is on the boat, and they're on the other side. What stands out to me here is that the disciples were getting used to who Jesus was. They were not surprised by it. They were with God, and he was doing things that only God could do. And then we come to John 9, where the man heals a man, where Jesus heals a man born blind. John 9 tells us that Jesus, about Jesus healing this man. In this story, Jesus passed a blind man and told his disciples that the reason he was born blind was so that the works of God might be manifested in him. This man was born blind for this moment when Jesus healed him. The Pharisees didn't like that Jesus once again healed on the Sabbath. There was an exchange between the blind man and the Pharisees, and after that, Jesus went to the man, and let's pick that up in verse 35 of John chapter 9. Jesus heard that they had put him out, and after finding him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking to you. And the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus called himself the Son of Man here. In fact, he often refers to himself this way in this book. What does that mean? The phrase son of man is found 93 times in Ezekiel and refers to the prophet's humanity. However, here, Jesus is referring, affirming his deity by referring to himself this way. So why did Jesus refer to himself this way? Charles Spurgeon has a great explanation that I'm just going to read to you. How fond our master was of the sweet title, the son of man. If he had chosen, he might always have spoken of himself as the Son of God, the everlasting Father, the Wonderful, the Counselor, the Prince of Peace. He has a thousand gorgeous titles, resplendent as the throne of heaven, but he cared not to use them, to express his humility and let us see the lowliness of him whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. He calls himself not the Son of God, but he speaks of himself evermore as the Son of Man who came down from heaven. 
Let us learn a lesson of humility from our Savior. What Spurgeon says in the next part is something that I had never thought about before, but it's so rich. Listen close. He says, Yet there is perhaps a more lovely thought still. Jesus Christ called himself the Son of Man because he loved to be a man. It was a great stoop for him to come from heaven and to be incarnate. It was a mighty stoop of condensation when he left the harp of angels and the songs of cherubims to mingle with the vulgar herd of his own creatures. But condensation though it was, he loved it. You'll remember that when he became incarnate, he did not do so in the dark. When he bring forth the only begotten into the work, world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. It was told in heaven, it was not done as a dark secret which Jesus Christ would do in the night that none might know, but all the angels of God were brought to worship the advent of a savior a span long, sleeping on a virgin's breath, breast and lying in a manger. And even afterwards, and even now, he never blushed to confess that he was man, never looked back upon his incarnation with the slightest regret but always regarded it with a joyous recollection, thinking himself three times happy that he had ever become the Son of Man. All hail the blessed Jesus. We know how much you, lo you love our race. We can well understand the greatness of your mercy towards those that your chosen ones. Jesus Christ called himself the Son of Man because he loved to be a man. Meditate on that one for a minute. The seventh sign is the death and resurrection of his friend Lazarus. The final of seven signs that John recorded only exists in chapter 11 of this gospel, and that is significant. Jesus and Lazarus were good friends. The sisters called their brother the one he loved. Jesus had the power to keep him from getting sick. He had the power to heal him before he was sent. We learned in chapter 4 that he had the power to heal him from a great distance. But Jesus didn't do any of those. He chose to put his power on display in a very specific way, by going to Lazarus and calling him directly at the tomb. Why? Let's look at John 11. Skip down to verse 38. So we can see the end of this story. So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time he smells, for he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I knew that you always hear me, but because of the crowds standing around, I said this, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus has done. This open display of power caused many to believe. In fact, keep reading. In verse 47, it says, Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the Sanhedrin together and were saying, What are we doing? for this man is doing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So from that day on, they planned together to kill Jesus. Jesus, in his act to save the life of his dear friend, set the table for his own death. This is why he let Lazarus die, so that through Lazarus' resurrection, Jesus could go to the cross. The seven signs that John told us about were proof that Jesus was the Messiah. 
let's talk a little bit about Jesus' deity. When I was in college, a dear friend of mine was walking through campus, and someone from some cult came up to him and confronted him and tried to derail his faith and tell him that their cult was better than Christianity. Um, in that interaction, they basically removed his belief or just messed with his belief that Jesus was God. And so this buddy shows up in Jenna and my house. Yeah, we were married and had a house in college, but that's a different story. Um, showed up in Jenna and my house, freaking out. And he's like, I've known this my whole life, and is Jesus really God? And so we spent some time walking through Scripture. I actually don't remember um, what we used in Scripture to help him understand that Jesus was God. Um, but it, it helped. But it was more important in that moment for him to realize that he needed to know his Bible, that he needed to be able to open up his Bible and see what it says about who God is. Um, and that was a, a dramatic change in that, in that friend's life. Um, and so I want to show a little bit here of what your Bible says about Christ's deity from the book of John. We already touched on the Old Testament predicting that the Messiah would be God. Um, but in the book of John, Jesus claimed a heavenly preexistence. We touched on that a little bit um, in what John claimed about Jesus. But if you look, and I'm just going to read through these verses for the sake of time. But in John 6, 62, it says, What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? He was somewhere before. 8.23, And when he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And 17.5, he says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus also claimed his ability to answer prayer in John 14. He says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. He also, we touched on the fact that he called himself the Son of Man, a title of divine implications in the Old Testament. Jesus also called himself the Son of God, a title his opponents understood as a claim to deity. In 5.18, he says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Jesus called himself, I am. Jesus claimed absolute unity with the Father, such that he could tell his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John affirms that Jesus was God. John teaches us that Jesus was God. There are a series of discourses throughout this book that I would urge you to read. They are some of the richest teaching that Jesus has in all of the Gospels. I intentionally intended not to spend time in those tonight um, because, like I said earlier, you guys eventually want to go home. Um, but I want to hi highlight one thing from um, my favorite prayer in all of Scripture. Turn with me to John 17. This chapter should be known to every single person in this room. This is a window into a prayer between two members of the Trinity. What a gift this page of Scripture is to us. And in this, he prays for us. Jesus prays to the Father for us. John 17, verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, speaking of the disciples, but for those also who believe in me through their word. Christian, that's you. That they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus' prayer for each person in this room is that we are unified with God in such a way that the world sees Jesus was sent as the Messiah. Our understanding of this truth was something that Jesus prayed for. We must spend time in this book and cherish it. There's a 
portion of this book that talks about the passion, the time when Jesus goes to the cross and defeats death. And I would encourage you to spend time in that to see the disciple that Jesus loved explain what happened in that time. But I want to end tonight with the Messiah's parting command. So go to the end of the book, John chapter 21, and look at verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. This is Jesus talking to Peter. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turning around saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter saw John and said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brothers that the, this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his witness is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written one after the other, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So what do we go home with? Follow the Messiah. Jesus is clearly the Messiah. Follow him. Follow the Messiah that was revealed as a creator from the beginning. Follow the Messiah that was revealed by John the Baptist. Follow the Messiah that was revealed through seven beautiful signs of his power. Follow the Messiah who is clearly God. Follow the Messiah that was revealed through a series of discourses culminating in a prayer with his Father. Follow the Messiah that was revealed in Jesus' death and resurrection. Grace Bible Church, follow Jesus with everything you have. Let me pray. Lord God, this book is such a sweet book to see who you are, to see you as the Messiah. Lord, it's written by one who had an intimate love of you, and that is on every single page. You can see the love for you. Lord, it's contagious. Lord, help us to open our word, open your word, and grow in our love for you by seeing you as the king, by seeing you as God, by seeing the power that you had. Lord, we love you, and we want to grow in that love. Lord, help us to follow you. In your name, amen.